ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد ما دي برادرز اند سيسترز ان الاسلام ان ذا باتل اوف حنين اور افتر ذا باتل اوف حنين وان اور بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم واز ديستريبيوتينغ غنيمه اور ذا بوتي اوف ذا وور We mentioned in our Sira lectures that a man came to him, as reported in the Sahih of Bukhari. A man came to him with a thick, shaggy beard, looking very uh, Bedouin. He was from the Bedouins. He had a wide forehead and a shaved hair. And when he saw that the Prophet was not giving him the amount of money he was giving to the others, He accused the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of not being fair. He said, "Ya Muhammad, i'dil." He addressed him with his first name, which is something that is extremely disrespectful. In fact, it is not allowed in our Sharia to address the Prophet with his first name. We say, "Ya Rasul Allah, Ya Nabi Allah." But the Bedouin came and spoke to him in a harsh, derogatory manner and said to him, "Fear Allah and be just." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Wayhak, woe to you! If I am not just in this earth, who is going to be just?" In another hadith, he said, "The one in the heavens trusts me, and you are not going to trust me." So the man turned around in arrogance and walked away. And obviously, this is the height of disrespect. In fact, this is kufr in our religion to 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 mock the Prophet and accuse him of being uh, uh, accuse him of being uh, untrustworthy. So the Sahaba demanded to execute him, but the Prophet said, "Leave him be. Even if you kill him, they leave him be. You will not be able to kill him because from his progeny, from his mentality, there will come other people. There will come other people." Who are these people? They will come other people. They will recite the Quran, but it will not pass their throats. This is an expression in Arabic. It means they will not comprehend it. It will be stuck within them. They will recite the Quran. Outwardly they will appear to be Muslim, but they will leave the religion like an arrow goes through the 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 prey suppose you're hunting a deer a very sharp and good arrow when you hunt it it will come in from one side and leave the other side so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said they will leave the religion like the arrow leaves its target a good arrow will leave its target and if i were alive when this group will come then i shall destroy them like allah destroyed the qaum ad the people of ad were all destroyed i will take charge of destroying them so in this hadith we learn of a prediction and this prediction is that there will be groups that will come in our umma there will be people that will come in our umma they are muslims we are not saying they are not muslim and they claim to be muslim and they recite the quran but they have nothing to do with the real teachings of our religion and as ibn taymiyyah and others said there are over 10 ahadith authentically narrated predicting this group no other group has been predicted with as many narrations as this one no other incorrect group or deviation has been predicted by our prophet sallam as this one in another famous hadith our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there will be many differences in my umma but there will be one group that will come that yaquluna min khawr min yaquluna min khayr qawl albariya they will say the best of all speech yuhsinun alkalam wa yusiun alfi'l they speak flowery speech but their actions are very terrible they shall recite the quran but it will not leave their throats and they shall depart from their from the religion just like the arrow departs from its prey and they are the shirar al khalq they are the worst of the creation 
Our Prophet ﷺ called this group the worst of the creation, even though right before he said they recite the Quran. So these are not non-Muslims he's talking about. These are people who believe in the Quran and recite the Quran. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, they call to the book of Allah, but they have nothing to do with the book of Allah. They call to the Sharia, but they have nothing to do with the Sharia. Pay attention to the words of our Prophet ﷺ. He is predicting a group that is calling to the book of Allah, to the Sharia. But he himself said they have nothing to do with the Sharia. And our Prophet ﷺ said those who fight them, those who do qital of them are closer to the book of Allah than they are. Meaning those who oppose these groups, they have more to do with the Sharia than this group that is calling to the Sharia. In another hadith, our Prophet ﷺ said that towards the end of times there will be a group of people. Asnani Sufahaul Ahlami Yaquluna min khayri qawlil bariya. Hudathaul Asnan, young men, sufahaul ahlam, with foolish dreams. So this group is not going to be the elders of the ummah. They're not going to be the wise people with experience. They're not going to be people of knowledge. They are a young group of overzealous individuals. Hudathaul asnan, a bunch of kids, we would say in our modern term, young men. Teenagers, early 20s, Hudathaul Asnan. You don't become a leader at the age of 20 years old. You don't become a leader of a movement and you have barely experienced life. No, not just this. Sufahaul Ahlam. They have the most bizarre, the most, the most ludicrous uh, dreams, or, or, or not dreams here, but goals is the point. They have these goals that are totally unrealistic, and yet their speech is very flowery. If you listen to them, you will be mesmerized because their speech sounds so good. And yet our Prophet ﷺ said that they will leave this religion. Again, the same analogy, like the arrow leaves its prey. And our Prophet ﷺ also said that تَحْقِرُونَ صَلَاتَكُمْ بِصَلَاتِهِمْ That your salah, you will think it is nothing when you look at their salah. And your reciting of the Qur'an, you will think it is nothing when you look at them. And your religiosity, you will think it is nothing when you look at these people. And yet he said, they have nothing to do with me. They have nothing to do with me. And the final hadith will quote, our Prophet wasallam said, that these people are the worst of my ummah. And those who kill them or those who get rid of them are the best of my ummah. And the hadith is in Al-Bazaar and other uh, hadith, hadith books. So the Prophet ﷺ called them the worst of the ummah. Now who are these people? Who are these people? There are over 10 ahadith predicting this group of overzealous fanatics. Over 10 narrations, each one of them describing certain things about these people. They are young, they are upstartish, they are foolish, they have grandiose dreams, they speak good. Every hadith that mentions their speech says their speech is mesmerizing, meaning what they're calling to is good. The other hadith says they're calling to the Sharia, they're calling to the Book of Allah, they're calling to Islam, but their actions have nothing to do with Islam. Islam. By unanimous consensus of all scholars of Islam, all historians, these ahadith, they apply to a classical group that came in early Islam by the name of the Kharijites, Kharijism. The name of the Kharijites. So who are these people? And why are we talking about them today? Well, we will get to that, both of these questions, inshaAllah ta'ala, in this khutbah. Firstly, who are these people? Well, classical Kharijism, the original group of Kharijites, they began historically in the year 36 or 37 after the Hijrah, very early on. And what happened was when Ali ibn Abi Talib, the famous Khalifa, the fourth Khalifa of Islam, when Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to stop the bloodshed and bring about a truce between him and another companion, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, they were having uh, some, uh, some problem, some bloodshed was between them. But neither group accused the other of being un-Islamic or evil. It was a political difference of opinion. And there was some bloodshed, some wars took place. So Ali ibn Abi Talib decided to stop this bloodshed and call about a truce. So he called Muawiyah, he called the representative representatives of Muawiyah and the both of them they agreed to an arbitration and they said no more war we will have peace and they were all a number of conditions put and both Ali and Muawiyah agreed to these conditions so alhamdulillah it appeared as if the ummah was going to be at peace what happened 
a group of 6,000 men. A group of 6,000 men from the camp of Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they broke away. And their leader was Abdullah ibn Wahb al-Rasibi, his name is Abdullah ibn Wahb al-Rasibi. Their leader was a fanatical person basically, who accused Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of now becoming a non-Muslim. He, a nobody, nobody's heard of him before, accuses the son-in-law of the Prophet the Khalifa of the Muslims, the fourth greatest Sahabi who ever existed. He said, you are not a Muslim anymore. Why? Because you have rejected the book of Allah, according to this man. You have rejected the Sharia, and you have agreed to arbitration by men. You shouldn't agree to arbitration by men. People should not be solving the problems. It should be the book of Allah, the Sharia. And in one version, one of his followers even threatened to execute Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali said, woe to you. You are going to kill me because I disagree with you? In other words, what fanaticism? You want to kill me because we have these, these khilafat, these differences? But they insisted that Ali was mistaken and Ali tried to reason with them. Radiallahu ta'ala, he, he tried to reason with them. They would not listen. And so 6,000 of them marched away and they started their own group. And this was the first cult and the first sect ever in Islam ever to break away and theologically differ. The camp of Ali and the camp of Muawiyah went to war, but they did not consider each other to be deviated or misguided. They knew it was an issue of, of politics, really. They knew this, that it was an issue of politics. But this group, they were the first group to break away with a new understanding of Islam. And the term that was given to them from that time by the camp of Ali, and perhaps even Ali radiallahu anhu himself, was the term breakaways, kharijis. You have broken away. Because khariji, kharaja means to exit. Khariji means he has broken away. So they were called kharijites by the sahaba themselves. You have broken the unity of the ummah. You have broken the unity of the ummah. And you have exited. So you have kharaj. You have kharaju. And therefore, they were called kharijites by the sahaba themselves. And Ali ibn Abi Talib said to them as they departed. He said to them, as long as you stay by yourselves, and you worship in your own methodology and you have your own masjid, we will not harm you. But if you harm others, and if you start spreading mischievous on the earth, then we will have to fight you. Now notice here, they threatened to kill Ali. Ali did not threaten to kill them. And this is Islam. Just because you differ with a group, doesn't mean you have to force your opinion on them. He did not go to war with these 6,000. He didn't kill them. He didn't massacre them. He said to them, okay, if you're going to insist, then to you, your religion and your way to me, mine, you have your methodology, I have my methodology. We have no right to harm you unless you harm others. This is the spirit of Islam. Tolerance. He didn't agree with the Kharijites. He knew they're wrong. Of course they're wrong. But what are you going to do? You're going to kill them? You're going to force them to follow your creed? No. Okay, so he said, go. Go your way. But don't harm anybody else. So they went to a land or an area or a plain called Harura. And this, why, this is why some of the Sahaba also called them Haruriyun. Because that's where they all congregated. And... Ali ibn Abi Talib sent Ibn Abbas to debate with them. Ibn Abbas was the young budding scholar, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, the great alim, allama. He sent Ibn Abbas to debate with them. And Ibn Abbas told us their story. And again, the khutbah does not have the time to, to, to mention all of it in detail. But Ibn Abbas says, when I entered their camp, and it was at the midday when everybody is supposed to be sleeping, and the whole camp was buzzing with Quranic recitation. And ta'ajabt, he said, I was amazed. Everybody's sleeping, even in the camp of the Sahaba, you, after Dhuhr you go to sleep, it's very hot, you cannot do anything. But the camp of the Kharijites is buzzing with Quran, and they're all seeming to be religious. And so when they saw him, they said, what are you doing here? So he said, I'm here to find out what is your problem, what not. So they convened their, their seniors, and Ibn Abbas said to them, what is your problem? Tell me, what is your issue? Why have you broken away? So they gave three points, and again, the khutbah does not allow us to, to go in, but the number one point, Ali became a kafir because he didn't follow the sharia. So he's not following, they didn't use the term sharia, they said the book of Allah, which means the sharia. He didn't follow the book of Allah, and he agreed for arbitration. So, and they gave two other points, and Ibn Abbas debated with them, and he showed them that this understanding was incorrect. How do you follow the Qur'an other than by scholars interpreting the Qur'an? And he gave examples from the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, 
that if a husband and wife are having a fight, Allah says in the Quran, they cannot resolve the fight, then let the husband get one arbitrator and let the wife get another arbitrator and let them solve this dispute between them. So Ibn Abbas said, do you think that a marriage of a man and woman is more important or the ummah? They said, of course the ummah. So Ibn Abbas said, if Allah has allowed arbitration in a marriage between a man and a woman, you bring in arbitrators and you solve the problem. Why can't Ali and Muawiyah, who are far more important than any one marriage, bring arbitrators to solve their problem? And they were silenced. They could not respond because the Quran clearly allows arbitration. Clearly allows arbitration. It's not going against the Quran to actually have an arbitration between disputing people. They couldn't answer that. So then they moved on to the second, then the third. And, and Ibn Abbas answered all of them. And the time does not permit me to go into what he said. And after he debated and he won the debate, 2,000 of them, one third, they left the camp and returned to the camp of Ali ibn Abi Talib and only 4,000 remained. However, what ha appears to have happened is that those 4,000 that remained were the real fanatics. The 2,000 at least, they had a misunderstanding, they came back to the truth. The 4,000 that remained, they were really the overzealous, arrogant people. So what happened was they began irritating Muslims who were passing by, they began stealing, they began doing this and that, and eventually the worst thing that they did was that uh, one of the Sahaba or the children of the Sahaba who was now a young man, uh, 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 Abdullah ibn Khabbab ibn al-Arad, the son of Khabbab ibn al-Arad. Khabbab ibn al-Arad is one of the earliest converts in Mecca. And we mention him in our Seerah lectures many times. His son, Abdullah ibn al-Khabbab ibn al-Arad, was traveling with his family in the desert and he happened to pass by a group of them. And they captured him and he became frightened. Because he's a Muslim, he's in Islamic land. What are you doing? What, I'm a Muslim. I mean, I'm not in enemy territory that I, I should be terrified. So they captured him and his family. And they began to quiz him. And they said to him, what is your position about Ali ibn Abi Talib? So of course he is a brave young man. He's not going to lie. He's told them the truth. Ali is more knowledgeable than me and you. Who are you to criticize? Ali is more knowledgeable than me and you. And he is the Amir al-Mu'minin. He is the, the legitimate Khalifa. And so they said, you're a kafir. Because you have accepted Ali as your Khalifa. And his wife was nine months pregnant. And in front of him, La hawla la billah, they slit open her stomach. La hawla la la billah. And they killed the baby and then they killed her. And then as he is bound and tied, they butchered him. Ibn Asakir and others say, like a sheep is slaughtered. Now this is very important here. Because in our religion, if the Islamic State captures a criminal, a rapist, a murderer, and that person needs to be executed, the w manner of execution, yes it is in those days they would cut the head off, but it is done from the back. You take the prisoner and you cut him off. And in our times, the scholars say that you may execute a prisoner in any humane manner, whether it is by injection or by uh, guns or whatever, however execution is done. But in our sharia, we do not execute a legitimate criminal, a legitimate murder, i.e. the execution should be done. We do not execute him like we execute animals, like we kill animals. But how did the Kharijis execute Abdullah ibn al-Khabbab ibn al-Arat? By beheading him from the front. Keep this point in mind because you obviously understand the linkage between the modern people. This is not from our Sharia ah at all. This is the methodology of the Kharijites. And when they killed others of his family, they massacred his whole family, his wife, his children, and he was with a group of uh, servants. All of them were killed. Now Ali ibn Abi Talib, what was the condition he put on them? He said to them, as long as you don't harm others, you have your freedom. Now they massacred a Sahabi and the son of a Sahabi. They killed his wife in this brutal manner. And by the way, the books of history mention their fanaticism. That as their bloods are dripping with the blood of Abdullah ibn al-Khabbab, they pass by the garden of a Christian. And one of them, he plucked some grapes to eat. Another of them, he killed a pig that belonged to the Christian. And their leader went berserk, he freaked out. How dare you eat this haram because it's not allowed for you to pluck the grapes of this Christian. And how dare you destroy this property of the Christian. How could you have killed the pig because that is legitimately owned by the Christian. You have no right to kill the pig. Subhanallah. They have just massacred a Sahabi and the son of a Sahabi. They've just butchered his wife and in their fanaticism they think it is haram to take a grape from the garden and eat it. They think it is of course it is haram I'm saying. You don't take other people's property but look at his look at their fanaticism that 
after killing somebody, now they think they're so holy and righteous that you cannot kill a pig. And they paid recompense to the owner of the pig and for the, for the pig and for the grapes. They paid him money. Oh, we're sorry for killing your pig. We're sorry for taking your grapes after they had just killed the Sahabi and the son of the Sahabi. So subhanAllah, look at this overzealousness. And when Ali ibn Abi Talib heard of this, he fought them in the famous battle of Nahrawan in 38 Hijrah. He went to war with them and he destroyed them and he eliminated them from Harura. However, groups amongst them fled to other lands and so they remained in the Ummah here in their helter skelter, eventually a group of them emigrated to what is now the modern country of Oman and they established their own kingdom over there. And to this day, many of the people in that region follow a pacifist version. So what happened was over 14 centuries, Kharijism had many splinters, many different groups. They continually irritated the Umayyads and the Abbasids. They continually fought against the rulers and, and fought against other Muslims until finally all Kharijites of extreme mentality were eliminated and only the most pacifist version, and this is called Ibadism, it's the most pacifist version of Kharijism where they don't fight other Muslims. This is the only version of classical Kharijism that remains alive today. The earliest split in the Ummah, even before the Sunni Shia split, even before this split, the earliest split was the Kharijite split. And to this day, less than 1% of the Ummah follows that Ibadit theology and they are found only in two regions in the world, places in North Africa uh, and our Algerian brothers and whatnot. They know, they know there's a valley uh, somewhere uh, in their lands that there are, there are uh, Kharijites still Ibadites over there and as well in the land of Oman. In the land of Oman there are also Kharijites. However, the Kharijites that exist in those lands are not like these classic ones. They have toned down, they have a different now, much more mellowed down theology, but they are the descendants of those people. Now the question arises, why are we talking about these historical issues in this khutbah? And inshallah, I'll answer that question in the second part of this khutbah. Barakallahu ibrahim fi Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bima fihim al-ayati wa dhikr al-hakim aqoolu ma tasma'oon wa astaghfirullah al-Azim ali wa lakum wa li sa'i muslimin kulli dhambin fa astaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafuru al-rahim. الحمد لله الحمد لله الواحد الأحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد as to why we are talking about this classic group, then it is obvious in light of the current political affairs. Our Prophet ﷺ predicted in the hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad that this group will continue to rise forth with small, with small cults, with small reoccurrences until the day of judgment. So it is true that classical Kharijism, this group that came in the time of Ali, that group by and large dwindled away and one small subsect that is pacifist and toned down remains. But others of that ilk, others of that fanaticism will continue to rise until the day of judgment. And this is exactly what we see, my dear brothers and sisters, in light of the current circumstance, in light of these groups that are in Iraq and in Sham, in light of the beheading of the American journalists, and also the beheading and the death of hundreds and thousands of those who oppose these groups. Sunni and Shia, Muslim and non-Muslim, men, women and children, they have all been butchered in the most radical and the most crude manners by these people who are claiming to want the Sharia, claiming to want the Khilafah, claiming to want the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet exactly as our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, their speech is flowery, but their actions have nothing to do with me. Exactly as our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, they, their actions demonstrate they leave this religion like an arrow leaves its prey. And subhanAllah, we are currently facing two extreme trends in our ummah. The first extreme trend is perhaps more predominant here in these lands and that is a lackadaisical attitude not caring about the Sharia not wanting to follow Islam that is one extreme and I have spoken about this and lack of spirituality in so many khutbas. In today's khutbah, I'm speaking about the other extremism, and that is fanaticism, overzealousness, taking a misunderstanding of the religion, and then thinking that you are the holiest person alive. This is the other extremism, and that is the extremism of Kharijism. And the fact of the matter is, listen to what I have to say here, each of these extremisms feeds off the other. I repeat, each of these extremisms feeds off the other. Many non-practicing Muslims 
will tell you, oh, look at those fanatics. That's why I don't want to get too religious. Look at what happens when you have too much religion. You go berserk, you go crazy. And the Kharijite mentality or the extremists, they say, look at these lackadaisical Muslims doing nothing to help the problems in Palestine, the problems in Iraq, the problems here and there. They're just living their lives selfish, selfishly, completely absorbed in the dunya, not caring about the ummah. They need to be roused up. So each one of them feeds off the other. Each one of them needs the other to exist. The fact of the matter, my dear brothers and sisters, when you look at these fanatical extremist groups, you find the same symptoms that our Prophet ﷺ predicted in the Kharijis of old, these are modern manifestations of those groups. You find amongst them that they have this perverted understanding of the Sharia. Everybody wants to follow the Sharia that's a good Muslim. All of us want to follow the Sharia. But their version of Sharia is so bizarre. It is so perverted. They seem to be calling to it. But what they do has nothing to do with the Sharia. And by the way, the bulk of them, if not all of them, are totally ignorant of what the Sharia is. Just like the Kharijites when they have this very uh, superficial understanding of the Quran. They take one verse and, the, and khalas, that's it. That's not the way Islam works. Study the religion, become a scholar. Ibn Abbas debated them. He answered every one of their points. We also see in these groups that just like the Kharijites of old, anybody who opposes them, automatically he becomes a kafir. You cannot have disagreement with these people. And wallahi, I and every single da'i and caller to Islam who has criticized them. Look at our Twitter accounts that respond back to us and Facebook comments from the supporters of this group. You kafir, you sell out, you American dog, you this, you that. There can be no disagreement. Instantly, you become a non-Muslim. And I have gotten death threats myself, and I know others who have criticized them have gotten death threats online from these fanatics. Subhanallah, we are only saying don't kill innocent people even if you disagree with this does that mean you're going to now call us kafir and munafiq but this is the mentality of kharijites that there is it's black and white the world you're either with us or you're against us and this is not the mentality of a muslim with a different opinion ya akhi, our religion has differences of opinion in it suppose i disagree with one act doesn't make me a non-muslim even if you disagree with my interpretation doesn't make that to be a non-muslim and yet this is is exactly what we find. Also, my dear brothers and sisters, of the characteristics of the Kharijites of old is this bloodthirstiness that you want to just kill, kill, kill. Killing becomes a goal in and of itself. And blood becomes cheap. And this is not the methodology of our religion. What did our Prophet ﷺ even say to the first of those Kharijites, the one that said to him, I'dil ya Muhammad, he said, don't kill him, let him be, let him be. Let not the people say that I kill my own followers. He allowed this extremist to go free because he knew others would come. Even if I kill one, so what, another will come. Bloodshed and terror and violence is not going to solve problems. It will create more bloodshed and more terror and more violence. Also, these groups say, how come you only criticize us and you don't criticize the foreign powers? You don't criticize America, you don't criticize Israel. Wallahi, this is totally false. How many times have all of us criticized foreign policies, the Iraq invasion, the Afghanistan invasion, Guantanamo, on this mimbar, I have criticized and all of us have criticized. But we concentrate on these fanatics for many reasons. Reasons. First and foremost, what a nation and a country does, we don't expect them to follow Islam when they don't believe in Islam. A nation, our own nation, we all know, political analysts say, it's not a religious point, that they're more interested in oil. This is one of the main reasons of all of these conflicts. The false invasion is because of greed, it's because of money. The pretext of going in was not because of religion, it's because they want global power. This is the reality. So we don't expect them to act morally. However, people who are Muslim, we expect them to have a higher standard. People who claim to follow the Quran and Sunnah, it is our duty to correct them even more. Also, when Israel bombs the Palestinians and whatever is happening there, they're not doing it in the name of Allah, in the name of the religion. But when these groups kill those who oppose them, they say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and then they kill the person. No doubt, we have more of a right to correct those who kill in the name of Islam than those who kill in the name of power and greed. Yes, wallahi, we are not naive. 
and I say this as explicitly as possible, it is because of the false invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, it is because of the foreign policy that this country and others have generated, that the circumstances have been created to allow ISIS and Al-Qaeda to come forth. We didn't have ISIS 20 years ago. We didn't have Al-Qaeda with its threats and whatnot 15, 30 years ago. No doubt, this is undeniable reality, and this is not a religious person speaking. This is simple political analysis. Go read any genuine political analyst talking about the circumstances that are needed to create extremism. When these people have seen so much bloodshed, so much lies, when they have been bombed and killed themselves, what happens is the mentality then amongst the overzealous fanatics is we will do the same unto you what you have done unto us. Yes, we are not naive to this, but we tell these young brothers, and they're all young brothers by and large, they are young 20s and whatnot, you don't find amongst them senior leaders in the 60s and 70s, you don't find senior and ulama. You don't find people that have world experience amongst them. They're all a bunch of young rebels with naive utopic notions of establishing a global caliphate. We tell these brothers, read the Quran and Sunnah. Read history. Find out the classical Kharijites of old and see what their problems were. Brothers and sisters, the damage that these groups are doing to Islam Israel is not damaging Islam's reputation. Israel is massacring Muslims. That is true. But the reputation of Islam is not being affected by Israel. America is killing uh, with its foreign policy so many people, but it's not damaging the perception of Islam. Isn't that the case? But what these people are doing is damaging the religion of Islam. Just a few days ago on Fox News, and we don't expect much better from Fox News, one of the people there commented, all Muslims should be shot after the American journalist was beheaded. Why are we adding more fuel? This is not of our religion. An innocent civilian, an innocent journalist should not be executed and then in a gruesome manner and then displaying the video and whatnot. This is not just an Islamic, it is foolish. And what is going to happen with this hate except more hate being generated? My dear brothers and sisters, for all of these reasons, we have to always be critical of these extremisms, even as we are critical of foreign policy, of Guantanamo, of Iraq, of Afghanistan, of Israel. We always are critical of any oppression and we stand with the oppressed against the oppressor. But there is no doubt when the Muslim oppresses in the name of Islam, which is what is happening now, then our ghiyara, our honor, our jealousy for Islam, our, uh, our reason to criticize becomes much more. Not in our name. You're not allowed to kill people in the name of Allah, in the name of the Sharia, in this brutal manner. Innocent people. How many thousands have been killed, my dear brothers and sisters? And wallahi, we need to be as vocal as possible for the sake of our religion, for the sake of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the perception, not just amongst non-Muslims, wallahi, even non-practicing Muslims. And this is perhaps the saddest thing, that there are many amongst us who think, I don't want to become too religious, I don't want to become like those people. Subhanallah, my dear brothers and sisters, what these people are doing is not religion. Religion, religiosity, Islam, Iman, the more you have, the better it is for you. Do not misunderstand false religiosity with genuine religiosity. Religion will never harm you. Quran is never going to hurt you. Following the Prophet is always beneficial. These people do not represent our religion. Our Prophet was the most religious man. And yet he was a mercy to the world. He was the most religious man. And yet he was a mercy to the world. My dear brothers and sisters, don't fall for the trap of this binary, this two situation scenario. Wallahi, religion is nothing but good. But it has to be good religion. Religion is nothing but good if it is done properly. Genuine love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Following the Quran according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The more you have, the better it is. Let not the hatred of one group cause you to go astray. Be fair and just, the middle path, and good religiosity. This is what we want. My dear brothers and sisters, much more can be said. Time is of the essence here. Subhanallah, fanaticism. Fanaticism is never going to be helpful. Our Prophet ﷺ never reacted emotionally because of something that happened to him. Wallahi, all of us are angry at the political climate in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. All of us are angry at the bombing of innocent uh, 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 Palestinian civilians. All of us are angry at our own foreign policy. All of us.
us. But we don't react in haste. We don't react in blind rage. We don't react mere emotion. Our Prophet was tortured uh, and the Sahaba were tortured more than what is happening now. But they never once did a foolish act. They never once did something that would cause more harm to them. And that is the Sunnah of the Prophet And in it is our life. And in it is our ultimate success in this world and the next. My dear brothers and sisters, be careful of these groups and the opposites. Be careful of those who mock Islam amongst the Muslims, who mock religiosity. And be careful as well of those who have gone to extreme fanaticism. The middle path is always the best path, and that is the path of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always make us upon that path. Allahumma inni da'in fa'aminu. Allahumma la tada'na fi hadhi yawmi dhamman illa ghafarta, wa la hamman illa farrajta, wa la daynan illa qadayta, wa la maridan illa shafayta. اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بالسوء فاجغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قائل عليما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك رسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وتأيد القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة